Good morning. And happy Mother's Day. Yeah, let's give it up for all the mothers in the house today. And I want to just uh, say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers that may be watching online that are at a distant. And if your mother lives out of town, please give her a call. I already called, I FaceTimed my mother. She lives in Spain. She's 83 years old and um, made sure that uh, there's seven hours difference. So made sure that she heard from her son, one of her sons, happy Mother's Day. So mom, if you're watching again, happy Mother's Day. Love you. You're an awesome mom. Um, it's great to be with you today. Yeah, for all the mothers out there. I'm just going to ask for a moment, if you're a mother in the house today, would you please stand? If you're a mom, come on, all the moms that are here, grandmothers, mothers, come on, let's stand up just one moment. Let's give it up for these women that are here today. Thank you. Thank you, moms. We really do appreciate what you do. I also want to acknowledge that Mother's Day there's a spectrum of emotions on Mother's Day, and it's not always a celebration time because uh, some of you have been through different seasons. Maybe your mother is no longer with you, and I know that I want to acknowledge the fact that for mother, Mother's Day is not always a joyous occasion. In fact, I want to acknowledge, I'm going to read through this if it, this applies to you, uh, we, uh, to those who had your first child this year, we celebrate with you. Uh, any, any mothers in the house that you had your first child this year? Any mothers here? Yeah, okay, all right. There you go, a couple. Yeah, in the back as well. I know that my daughter and her husband had our, their first, my first grandchild, and so it's a special Mother's Day for us as well. But I also want to acknowledge that some lost their child this year, and so we mourn with you. To those who every day wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we acknowledge your pain, and we know that you have been through a difficult time. We mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we choose to walk with you. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, can I tell you, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate that today with you. To those of you who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers, we grieve with you. To those who have lived through driving tests, medical tests, and overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. Thank you, moms. To those of you have a, who have aborted children, we remember them and we remember you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we acknowledge that it's difficult to wait. To those who are step-parents, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those of you who envisioned lavishing love on your grandchildren, yet that dream has not come true yet, we are saddened with you. To those who have empty nest, we sympathize and we rejoice with you. Hey, I'm an empty nester. Let me say, I'm rejoicing more than I'm sympathizing. I love my kids, but I'm glad they're on their own. To those of you who are pregnant with new life, both expected and unexpected, hey, we anticipate with you uh, the birth of your child. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. We recognize that mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst today. And so I want to start this service just by praying a prayer of blessing over those that are mothers. Father, we thank you 
that today we are able to celebrate all over this nation. Women who have given birth to children. And we know, Father, that there are some that are excited today. We know that there are some that are struggling. And so we pray, God, that whether in pain or whether rejoicing, that you would step into the spaces right now, God, and let them know that you are present. I thank you, Father, for these women. I pray grace, courage, strength, power, contentment, and your presence more than anything else. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take your Bibles today and turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 10 through 14 of Philippians chapter 4. It's important that you listen today because I'm going to be talking about one of the great challenges, not only for mothers, but for any individual going or transitioning through seasons of life. I want to talk to you about finding and maintaining contentment. Contentment. It's difficult to experience and to hold on to contentment. And I realize that so many people live either in the past, thinking about the days where they were happy and content, or in the future, hoping that things would change somehow or awaiting a major change that would bring you contentment. But here's what I want you to know today. I want you to look up at me. This is really important. You do not have to live your life discontent. Contentment is a choice that you make that has nothing to do with the circumstances that you are living in, but has everything to do with your thinking and the choice that you make today. Philippians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is in a prison, a dungeon like prison. He's hungry, he's cold, he has no liberty, yet he writes a letter to a group of people that live in a city called the city of Philippi. We know them as Philippians, and so therefore the letter is called the letter to the Philippians. And 17 times in this book he talks about joy, which is ironic that he is in prison, yet the theme of his book is or this letter, is joy. And in chapter 4 of Philippians, he pauses and talks about something very powerful. He talks about contentment. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I need, I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Word of the Lord. So today I want to talk to you about contentment. If you're taking notes, there are three things I want you to keep in mind as you wrestle with grasping contentment at this stage in your life, not in the future, not in the past, but at this stage in your life. Write this down. Contentment is an attitude that you can learn to embrace at any season of life. Notice that the Apostle Paul says, he says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Say it with me. Content whatever the circumstances. Content. What I've discovered is that oftentimes 
We base our contentment off our circumstances. And if our circumstances are good, then we're content. If we're struggling with our circumstances, then we lose contentment. The Apostle Paul says, I've learned that I can be content regardless of the circumstances that I'm going through. Now, I want to reiterate that. And you say, well, pastor, what do you mean by being content? Well, contentment has been defined as the quality or state of being contented, the inner sense of well-being that defies your circumstances. Uh, Someone else defined it this way. It is that inner sense of rest or peace that comes from being right with God and knowing that he is in control of all that happens. A discontentment, on the other hand, is defined as feeling of not being satisfied, a lack of contentment or desire for something else. I want you to understand this right now. There are some of you right now at this point in time that you have been living in a state of discontentment. In fact, some of you have been living discontent so long you don't remember what it's like to be content. And if I were to ask you why are you so discontent, chances are that I would have answers that point to your circumstances. Pastor, I would be content if I finally find the right guy. But I feel kind of lonely right now, and so I'm discontent because I don't feel like, uh, you know, there's a longing there. Pastor, I would be content if I were married by now because I feel like my clock is ticking. Pastor, I would be content if I weren't married because I married this guy. (laughs) Pastor, I would be content if I didn't have to put up with these little kids that are constantly pulling on me and dragging at me and and I'm just overwhelmed by taking care of these little kids. Pastor, I would be content if I had little kids again because these older kids, pastor, wow. Sometimes we look at our past and we celebrate days gone by And remember those as the days of contentment. Or we look at our future and we think, if only this happened in the future, I would be content. But contentment eludes us. And here's what I want to tell you. Your contentment should not, cannot depend on your circumstances. You have the ability right now, today, as I speak, to engage and learn how to embrace a spirit of contentment. Where does contentment come from? Well, let me tell you that contentment is an attitude or an emotion that is grown in our thinking. Your contentment right now is primarily dependent on your thinking. If you have discontented thinking, you are a discontented person. If you have thinking that leads to contentment, then you will embrace contentment regardless of your circumstances. Let me tell you the kind of thinking that leads to discontentment. The Apostle Paul says, I have learned. So we understand that contentment is a learned attitude or behavior. It's not something that it just happens to you. Some of you think you're victims of your emotion, that you can do nothing to be more content or less content. But the Apostle Paul says, I have learned. That means it's something I did not know before. It's something that because of knowledge, because of practice, because of rehearsing, that I've come to know. And so I put in practice my knowledge in order to gain my contentment. You can learn to be content or you can learn to be discontent. Here's four habits that many people put into practice that automatically, without knowing, lead to discontentment. They all have to do with our thinking. Number one habit, habitually comparing yourself to others. If you are in the habit of continually comparing yourself to others, chances are you live discontent because there's always someone that has more money than you have. There's always someone that looks better than you look. There's always someone that has things that you don't have, the attributes that you desire, weight that you want, 
a house that you desire, a car that you want, friends that you, that you would like to have, a social life that you envy, there are always people that have more than you. And if you live your life in constant comparison, then I can guarantee you are continually discontent. And how many of you know that we typically compare ourselves to people that have more than we and not less than we have? I don't know a lot of people that compare themselves to some group uh, that compare themselves to tribal people in Africa that have no running water, no electricity, and say, you know what, I'm pretty happy because look what I have. No, no, no. We typically compare ourselves to people that have more than we have or have what we want and we don't have. And so, you know, by the way, I want to just say this, that this has been accelerated or has been exaggerated also by social media. Studies tell us that since 2012, especially uh, millennials or Gen Z suffer with a greater degree of anxiety, loneliness, isolation, and even suicidal ideation, all based in discontentment, the only difference that they can see is that since 2012, everybody has a smartphone. And so you look at images of someone that's smiling, going to fun places, exotic places. They all look slimmer, trimmer, more beautiful. Because how many of you know there's angles to make you slim down? And so you scroll for hours and hours on social media looking at people that look better than you, that look like they're happier than you, that look like they're having more fun than you, and you say, what's wrong with my life? Because my life doesn't compare with the people that I see in social media. And so there has been a growing sense of discontentment in our lives because we compare ourselves with a false pseudo-reality. And secondly, if you are in the regular habit of devaluating what you currently possess, if you look at what you currently possess, what you currently have, and you undermine it, you devaluate it, you minimize it, you despise what you have, then chances are you'll live with discontentment. If every time you go out to your car, you look at it and you say, this is a piece of junk, boom, I just, I'm embarrassed of this car. I don't even park it in the church parking lot. I park it two blocks away because I just can't stand this old piece of junk. If you walk into your house and you can't stand it and you compare it to others, if you look at your wife and you compare it to others or your husband, you compare it to others or your kids and you compare them to others and you despise what you have, you look at your job and it's never good enough. You look at what you possess and it's never good enough. You look at your body type and you always think that you fall short of it. If you minimize and despise what you have, then you will always be discontent. So if you are in the habit of comparing, if you are in the habit of despising, or if you focus on what you don't have, number three, if you are constantly focusing on what you don't have, God never holds you responsible for what you don't have, only what you do have. But oftentimes I find people that are fixated with what they don't have and barely conscious of what they do have. And so I just wish I were a foot taller, but I'm not. Or I wish I had that degree, but I don't have it. I wish I had this, um, this personality, but I don't have it. I wish I fixated on what you don't have and constantly focusing on what you don't have, but ignoring, minimizing, not celebrating what you do have, you will probably be discontent. And lastly, number four, I'm talking about habits that lead to discontentment in our thinking. Number four, living in, when we're not living in and enjoying the present. Some people I talk to, they either live in the past, the glory days of old, or they live in the present or the future where they are waiting for something. 
So either they live in the past where they've lost something, or they live in the future where they haven't gained that something that they want. And so we've all experienced it, the person that every time you talk to them, they want to talk about the old glory days, remember those days, and it's, it's the 40-year-old guy that still wear, wears his football t-shirt because when he was a quarterback in high school, he was popular, but those were the days, and you kind of want to say, hey, those were 20 years ago, let's kind of move on from that. Or the person that's always talking about when they're going to retire or when something's going to happen in the future. I can't wait these, for these kids to grow up or I can't wait to be able to move down to Florida and play golf or I can't wait for me to be able to advance in my job or it's going to be fun when I finally have kids. It'll be, it'll be great when I finally get married. And so they're living in the future or living in the past, but they haven't understood the power of enjoying and celebrating the present. Your contentment ultimately comes from your thinking. So if you compare yourself to others, if you devaluate what you currently possess, if you focus on what you don't have, and if you're not living and enjoying the present, then I can guarantee you, you probably sit right now in this auditorium as a discontented individual. And you say, well, pastor, is it a sin to uh, think the wrong way? It's not a sin, but what happens is that if you allow your mind to go in that direction, it leads to sinful behavior. You see, the apostle Paul said, I've learned contentment. Where did he learn it? In his mind, in his thinking. He learned it by how he engaged in life, how he perceived his difficulties and what happens, let me tell you what happens when you engage in thinking that leads to discontentment, it leads to sinful attitudes like envy. Envy is that painful or resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by another joined with the desire to possess the same advantage. That's envy. Or jealousy. A hyper-protective desire to hoard something I do have to keep it from someone else. That's jealousy. Or greed. Greed is the tendency to selfish craving, grasping and hoarding. A selfish or excessive desire for more than is needed or deserved, especially of money, wealth, or of possessions. Or resentment towards the world, people, or a system that keeps me at a disadvantage, bitterness of spirit because the world I live in is not fair. And see, what I want you to understand is that when you engage in thinking that leads to discontentment, it leads to attitudes, jealousy, envy, greed, or resentment that steal your joy, that separate you in your walk with God from the joy that God has called you to. And many of us live that way day after day, year after year. And if I were to ask you, why are you discontent? You're not going to point to your brain or your thinking. You're going to point to someone in your life or a circumstance in your life. Hear me well. Pastor, I would be content if my husband would nourish me and acknowledge me and bring me flowers like he used to, if he would just love me the way I deserve to be loved, then pastor, I would be content. Can I tell you something? If you make anybody responsible for your contentment, you have just made them an owner over your joy. Well, pastor, I would be content if my boss would acknowledge me and not put so much stress on me and not overwhelm me and just, just acknowledge the work that I do. Then I would be content. You have just made your boss the owner of your joy. Anytime you make someone else the owner of your joy and contentment, you have just displaced who God should be and let someone else own your contentment. The Apostle Paul, who's in a prison with prison guards, is not saying, if I could only be let out of jail, 
If my jailer were just kinder to me, if I could only have my liberty back, then I would be content. The Apostle Paul is saying, I have learned, I have learned that a jail cell cannot take my contentment away. I have learned that a prison guard has no power over taking my joy away. That my joy and my contentment is not based on what someone does or doesn't do or my circumstances, that my contentment goes above and beyond people and circumstances. I have learned that. I want you to understand that because this is a powerful thing, that contentment is a learned attitude. Your contentment is self-contained. You don't need imports to make you content. Many of us are still waiting for imports to make us content. Number two, write this down. Not only is contentment is an attitude that you can learn to embrace at any season of life. Number two, contentment is an attitude that you can maintain even when life seems difficult or unfair. The Apostle Paul says in verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned, hear me, I have learned the secret of being content. In any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, the Apostle Paul says this, I have learned the secret. You know, we all like secrets. What is a secret? A secret is something that few people know that it's hidden from the majority. The word that he uses for secret, by the way, is in the Greek, meow, and it's found only in this place in the entire New Testament. This is the only place in the entire Bible that this word is found. I have found the secret, uh, translated literally to mean the mystery, uh, to, to the, this intimate understanding that most people don't grasp. I have discovered the mystery of contentment. I have discovered the secret of how to be content that most people live their entire life without grasping. And Paul is trying to share it from a prison cell, content, full of joy, in difficult circumstances with the Philippian believers. Now, he'll dive into this secret a little bit in the next verses. But I want you to understand that it's tied into what it tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes is in the Old Testament and uh, written by one of the wisest people that lived on the face of this earth. People traveled all around to hear the wisdom of Solomon. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Verse 11, listen. He has made, who's he? God. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom the work that God has done from the beginning. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And I don't, know, I don't have time to read all of that section, but he says there's a time to laugh and a time to cry. There's a time for life and a time for death. There's a time to plant and there's a time to, to reap. There's a time for everything in life. Listen, he has made everything beautiful in its time. You say, well, pastor, I don't think that death is beautiful. Well, in its time, everything is beautiful. There are seasons of pain that if we know how to embrace contentment, we even find beauty 
in seasons of pain, in seasons of loss, in seasons of transition. We find beauty in it because God has made everything beautiful in its time. You know, I, I, I encounter people sometimes that, well, they resist transition. Uh, there are some people that hate growing older. They just hate it. They resist it. They try to fight it. It's coming at you, though. I talk to some people that say, just I can't stand growing older. You know, I wake up and my joints hurt a little bit. My face is more wrinkled. I don't have the energy that I had before. I heard someone say, hey, God, waste youth on the young. But I've talked to other people. I just talked to someone recently that told me how much they enjoy aging. And they said, you know, yeah, I don't have the energy that I had when I was 19, but I have a, a greater degree of patience and wisdom, and, and things don't rattle me as much as they used to, and I feel like I've experienced life, and I'm watching my kids grow now and mature now, and there's a lot that I can impart to them, and they told me, I love this season of life. Hey, if you're a grandmother here today, how many grandmothers do we have in the house? Just raise your hand if you're a grandmother, yeah. And how many great grandmothers do we have? Raise your hand if you're a great grandmother. Come on, I'm looking for some great grandmothers. Okay, I see a couple great grandmothers in the house as well. Can I tell you something? Listen to me, great grandmother. I wanna tell you something. There is something beautiful about a great grandmother that's engaged and accepted that she's a great grandmother. When she's full of joy and love for God, there's something, there's a dignity and a beauty in an aging woman that's embraced it and just oozes wisdom and, and, and grace and, and uh, you, you're, you're spreading it to your grandchildren and your, chi and your children. And maybe, yeah, okay, maybe, you can't compete with the physical beauty of your 20-year-old self, but you don't have to compete with the beauty because internally, if you've aged well, there is an incredible beauty of who you are today, and we celebrate that beauty. You see, what I want you to know that there's, everything is beautiful in its time. No matter what season you're at in life today, no matter what season you're at. The expectation that God has for you is that you would embrace contentment. Contentment. Contentment does not, does not depend on the season that you're in. Every season has its beauty, and you discover that beauty, you live in the present, you enjoy it, you invite God into the present, and you say, God, I'm going to live in this season. And I've told young parents, I've told uh, parents as we talk about parenting and different seasons, my wife and I have chosen to embrace the season that we're in and find the beauty in the season that we're in without trying to compare it to other seasons. How many of you know that sometimes you sort of uh, you sanitize this, the past seasons. And with time, they seem better than what they were. Because you only remember the good things. You know, I'm, hey, I remember the three years that I dated my wife. Those were great times. But I'm glad I'm not dating back then. Because I didn't know, am I going to marry her? Is she going to say yes? Is, I forget that part. That was a great season. And when we had our first child, that was a great season. We enjoyed it. But I forget the sleepless nights. I forget how tired I was. That was a great season. And when my kids were small and they would come to the uh, door running, Daddy, Daddy, hold me. I mean, I think about that and I think, that was such a great season. Yeah, but I forget. Man, I could barely breathe because they were smothering me all the time. And I barely had any extra time. That was a great season. I love that season. And when they're in high school, I love the season as they learn to grow into maturity. But, but I forget the rolling of the eyes. I forget, oh, Lord, where are they at right, not right now? What's going to happen? Who are they going to marry? Well, I I hope they're not in trouble. Hey, that was a great season. Now, every season has its beauty. 
And you can't change the seasons, but you can embrace the season that you're in and say, God, I know that that you have made everything beautiful in its time, so I choose to embrace the beauty of this season. Let me ask you this. When's the last time you've looked for the beauty of the season that you're in? When's the last time you celebrated the beauty of the season that you're in right now? And say, okay, God has put me in this season. I'm gonna celebrate it. I'm going to take it in. I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, for this season. It's not the season I'm going into. It's not the season I'm come to. But thank you, God, for the season that I'm in right now. And the Apostle Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Listen, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or one, listen, look up at me. The Apostle Paul is saying, I've learned that even when my needs are not met, I can still experience contentment. Even when I don't have the freedom that I would desire, I can be content. Even when I don't have the financial resources that I like to have, I can still be content. Even when I'm not getting from my spouse what I exactly want from them at the time, I can still be content. Even when my relationship life doesn't look like I would want it to look right now, I can still be content. Even when I don't have the health that perhaps I would like to have and enjoy the, 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 the physical health that I'd wanna have, I, I can still be content. Even when I'm not experiencing all my needs being met, it doesn't mean that I have to live in discontentment. The Apostle Paul says, I've learned the secret of even when all my needs are not being met the way that they could be met, I've learned the secret of being content. It's powerful. Because it's rooted not in our circumstances. You know, oftentimes our discontentment is rooted in selfish desires, our idols, our desire to control our circumstances. And there's something that happens when we die to certain things and live to God that brings about contentment. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this should be added to you as well. Can I tell you something? Oftentimes we pursue things that, think, that we think will make us content, but ultimately when we reach them, they don't bring about contentment. I'll never forget they ask a billionaire, how much money does it take to make you happy? His answer, a little more. Oftentimes we live our life, and by the way, can I tell you this? Contentment doesn't mean complacency. I believe you can be content and have ambition and goals. Contentment doesn't mean that you just don't care. Contentment means that you have a sense of well-being even as you pursue your goals. Uh, contentment is not the same as complacency. Complacency means I don't care, I don't have goals, I don't set standards, I don't try to achieve excellence, I don't try to improve. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about having a spirit of contentment and you can still be aggressive in growing yourself and ambitious in improving your life, but you have a spirit of contentment while you're pursuing the things that God has placed upon your heart. The Apostle Paul says that he's learned the secret of being content. Romans chapter eight, verse 28 says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those that are called according to his purpose. I want you to understand this, that God is not the author of everything that happens in your life, but God can take whatever happens in your life and use it for your good. This is important to understand. 
God has made everything beautiful in its time, and there's a secret of contentment and understanding that God is in control, and I'm trusting God. My circumstances don't give me contentment. And you say, well, pastor, how can I be content when bad has happened in my life, when I've lost a partner, or my son is involved in addictions, or my job is insecure, or I'm dealing with this health issue? How can I be content? The Bible tells us that God takes all our circumstances for those that love God, and he works it to the good. He doesn't create all things all bad things don't come from God, but God can take even the bad things and God could bring beauty out of it so everything is beautiful in his time. Amen. We have a ministry. We have a ministry up in the Humble Park area, part of New Life Centers that was started years ago called Arise Creation. Arise Creation is a mentoring program for young girls. The idea is, can we take 13 and 14-year-old girls, 12-year-old girls that some of them come from difficult family backgrounds, and can we teach them to do something with their hands and create beauty, even living in a neighborhood where there's a lot of violence and chaos? And so years ago, we started a program, and the very first project that these girls engaged in was to make jewelry and they found broken glass on the street. The first place that they found broken glass was at a bus stop where there had been gun violence that had shattered some glass by a bus stop. And so they swept up a bunch of these little pieces of glass, put it in a bag, took it back to their workshop, and their mentors helped them make pieces of jewelry out of broken glass. Now, if you see the broken glass on the street, it's a reminder of the violence in the community, the gun violence in that community, people being shot and killed, and there's craziness there sometimes because of the gang violence. Yet what these young girls did is they took what that which is symbolic of brokenness and they took it and said, we're going to make it symbolic of beauty. And so they took these broken glass and they wove it into necklaces and they mounted the pieces of glass on necklaces. And now Arise Creation, they have an internet uh, store. Uh, the, these, they, they continue to make these creative pieces of jewelry. And I think it's a great illustration of what God does with our life. He takes the broken pieces of our life and he makes something beautiful that reminds us that God can bring beauty even out of brokenness. And listen, if you're here today and you say, Pastor, my life has been a patch of a lot of brokenness. There's dysfunction and toxicity. My family was broken. My childhood was a mess. I have a lot of hurt and pain in my life. It's hard for me to be content. I simply want to say God is a master. And taking even pain and brokenness in your life. Not the author of what happened to you, but the master of taking the broken pieces that are symbolic of pain and creating something beautiful, powerful, compelling, your story of healing, your testimony of redemption, taking what people would have thought would destroy you, but yet God has taken it and he's creating something that out of your pain will fuel healing to other people's lives because God makes everything beautiful in his time. I want you to remember that, mothers. And then lastly, the Apostle Paul closes with this. Listen, number three, write this down. Contentment is an attitude that is fueled through the supernatural power released in us. Verse 13 of Philippians chapter 4 is one of the most quoted verses in Scripture, especially by athletes. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
This version says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I think Kobe Bryant even had a tennis shoe where the, that scripture was on his shoes. People love to quote it. I can do all things. The, the guy that's going to bench 400 pounds, I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Arr! Our team is going uh, gonna to win the Super Bowl. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen, I get the feeling, but that's a misquotation of that verse. This verse is not to give you a motivational talk when you're trying to do something difficult, although God does help us to overcome something difficult. The Apostle Paul is specifically talking about having an attitude of contentment in this verse. So in essence, what the Apostle Paul is saying is, it's very difficult in certain places of life to keep contentment. But no matter how difficult your life has been, no matter how challenging your circumstances have been, guess what I've discovered? I can do all things through Christ who releases strength in my life. In essence, what the Apostle Paul is saying is this, that your contentment, your sense of joy is impossible to maintain on your own strength. You need the power of God to do it. What is the power of God? It's released via the Holy Spirit. The word used here for strength is the word that we get the word dunamis from. We get the word dynamite from. We get the word power from that word. In other words, I can do everything through the, the dynamic power that God releases into my life. I cannot do it in my own strength. I have to tap into a strength that's bigger than me, higher than me, greater than me. It's the power of the Almighty God released through the Holy Spirit into my life that allows me to be strengthened enough to hang on to my joy when circumstances would beat the joy out of me. Here's what I want you to know. The Apostle Paul in a prison cell says, I can do all things. I can keep my contentment through the power that God releases in me through his Holy Spirit. Because of God, I trust him. I believe in him. I allow his power to flow in me. I can keep my contentment. So as I close today, I guess my question to you is, how content are you? Honestly. How content are you? Have you been living in a perpetual state of discontentment? Pastor, my circumstances are really hard to maintain contentment. I, I know they're hard. But the Apostle Paul said, I've learned the secret. And the secret lies in the power that's released from God to me. And so I come to God and I say, God, strengthen me to embrace a spirit of contentment. Teach me to embrace habits of thinking that lead to contentment and empower me supernaturally not to lose my joy. I'm going to ask that you stand with me. I know this message can apply to everyone, not just mothers. How about it? But as we close our service today, I want to do something I've done for a long time. I want to pray specifically for mothers. And so if you feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable, I'm going to ask that you as a mother, grandmother, whether you are a first time, first year mother, or whether you have been a mother for 60 years, I would like to pray over you. And so I'm going to ask that you would just make your way forward and just come and stand somewhere here up front. If you feel comfortable doing so, we have mask on. And, uh, but just, just make your way up front. Could you do that? Just make your way up front, moms. 
Yeah. Here you go, moms. Yeah. Come on, moms. I see a lot of beauty in front of me. Not just physical beauty, but beauty of character, perseverance, loving God. I want to pray for you. Some of you are battling to hang on to your contentment. Some of you, if you're honest, you've lost a while back your spirit of contentment. My prayer is that you would regain it. My prayer is that that you would be able to tap into your contentment and say, God, I, I am going to regain. I'm not going to live in the past. I'm not going to live in the future. I'm going to find the beauty of the present. I'm going to embrace the beauty of the present. I'm not going to compare myself to others. I'm not going to minimize what I have. I'm not going to despise what I have. I'm going to find the beauty of the moment and I'm going to trust you because life may not look like I anticipated it would look like, but you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so I'm going to trust you that you work all things to the good of those that love you. And so today I'm going to trust your goodness. I'm going to allow you to strengthen me so that I could have joy even in the midst of difficult times, God. And so I want to pray with pray for you. If you feel comfortable, could you just raise your hands to the Lord, ladies? Father, you see these mothers. The first year mothers, the 20th year mothers. Lord, you see their desire to live with the spirit of contentment. And so I pray in Jesus' name that you would empower these ladies with a new sense of divine deposit in their life. I pray in Jesus' name that they would discover a new sense of contentment, even some of them in difficult circumstances. God, could I pray that you would release power from on high via your Holy Spirit, that they would know that you are with them? I pray for a strength to surge inside of them to face the challenges that they have. I pray that they would feel your presence walking alongside of them. I pray, God, that you would arise them as women of dignity, worth, and value, made in the image of the Most High God, living for God, desirous to please you, Father. Give them strength and grace that they need during this season. I pray, Father, for those that have strained relationships with their sons and daughters, God. I pray in Jesus' name that you would reconcile what needs to be reconciled. I pray that you would heal what needs to be healed, God. But more than anything, I ask that grace upon grace upon grace, unmerited, undeserved favor would be poured out in their life. That strength to find contentment. And I ask this in the powerful, glorious name of Jesus the Christ, in whose name I pray, amen and amen. God bless you, mothers. We're going to close with the song. You can go back to your seat. We're going to close with this song. God bless you and have a wonderful Mother's Day. Let's sing.